Hello, hello. For returning subscribers, welcome back. For new viewers, welcome. If you're new, please hit the subscribe button. My name is Mark Jager. I shoot stills, time lapse, and video. You can see some of my work at Vimeo on U and YouTube at the links on the screen below. You may already be shooting time lapse, or maybe you just want to. There is some mystery about shutter speed and interval that I'm going to eliminate. I will explain the science behind the choices of shutter speed and shutter interval. This is important because these two parameters control motion blur and time compression, and those effects strongly change the look of the finished work. Let's get into it. Video is an extension of motion picture film technique and equipment. For feature films, it was and still is common to shoot at 24 frames per second. Many cameras used a rotating shutter that exposed the film half the time. Half of 360 degrees is 180. This exposure method resulted in what is still regarded today as the filmic look. For 24 frames per second video, this is easy to calculate as 1 48th second shutter speed. Without motion blur, the frame-to-frame -frame transitions in time-lapse appear choppy or staccato. For most viewers, the staccato look is not as pleasing as having the addition of motion blur to create the illusion of smooth. Human brains adjust very well to the 180-degree shutter. We perceive the motion as smoother than it actually is and sharper than it is. Let's consider shot-to-shot -shot interval. The capture frame rate and the playback frame rate are intertwined. For time-lapse shooting, these two frame rates control time compression. Let's hit the science a little bit using three examples. If you capture a scene using a half-second interval and 300 seconds of clock time, you'll have 600 captured frames. If you render the 600 at 30 frames per second, the playback will be 20 seconds. This is a 15 to 1 compression of time. With a one second interval, those 300 seconds of clock time result in 300 frames. Rendered at 30 frames, the play will be 10 seconds. This is a 30 to 1 compression of time. All movement, this is important, in the one second interval time lapse happens at twice the apparent speed of the half second interval time lapse. If you use a 5 second interval, 300 seconds of clock time rendered at 30 frames is 150 to 1 compression of time. The video will play in just 2 seconds. With long shutter speeds, slow moving objects may disappear. Here's a still taken from a time lapse where the person walking on the right side of the frame is almost gone. Motion blur is not always necessary. In this landscape time lapse, the shutter speed started moderately fast and increased to control brightness as the sun came up. The short shutter speeds are okay when the majority of the scene is not moving and you want to see foreground detail. Remember, the information here is the science underlying the choices for shutter and interval. While the 180 degree rule is good lots of time, there are no go to jail moments and breaking rules is sometimes the exact right thing to do. Understanding the principles will allow you to decide. Let's examine how interval and shutter work with a traffic scene on a moderately busy street. For reference, here is a clip of normal video to show the scene in real time. I also shot time-lapse of the scene at a series of settings to demonstrate the differing looks you get as you change shutter and interval. Here are still photographs taken from the middle of the time-lapse sequences. Each shot is annotated with the shutter speed so you can discern the changes. As the time the shutter is open increases, the motion blur increases. Now, Examine the time-lapse clips and notice that at short shutter times, the motion is staccato. As you get to the 180-degree shutter, 1 60th second in this case, 
the motion smooths out. As the shutter speeds get longer than that, the blur continues to increase, but the blur is not as visible as in the individual stills. By combining fast motion and motion blur, the filmmaker is conveying to the viewer that the scene is fast. The speed of moving objects is important to choosing shutter time in time lapse. Object speed changes the distance moved during the time the shutter is open. For clarity, I've included an example here. Let's say that a car is moving across the field of view at 30 miles per hour. If a shutter speed of 1 1,000th second is used, the car will move about one half inch during the exposure. That's just a little bit. If you use a shutter speed of 1 5th second, the car will move about nine feet during the exposure. In the 1,000th second exposure, the car will be frozen with little or no apparent motion blur. In the 1 5th second exposure, there'll be substantial motion blur. Another consideration for shutter speed is motion direction. When an object is moving across the field of view, motion blur is most obvious. When an object is moving toward or away from the camera, the motion blur is less obvious. Humans and cameras see motion in crossing objects better than they do for objects moving to and from the point of view. Now distance also has an influence on motion blur. Near moving objects will have more apparent motion blur than distant ones. A car zooming by close to you has lots of motion blur. A car 500 feet from you at the same speed and lens magnification will have greatly reduced apparent motion blur. The next examples show a small stream on a winter day. The first clip shows you what the real time scene looked like. Now you can see short time lapse clips where the shutter speed changes and the interval remains constant. The appearance of the water changes. Next. The shutter speed is constant, but the interval changes. The water appears to be flowing faster and faster as the interval increases. The appearance of the water changes, but it is not the same kind of change as that caused by shutter speed. One change blurs the water and the other changes the apparent speed. I left the stream and went to the mall where it was much warmer. Burr, I was turning into a popsicle at the stream. Here you can see people walking through the mall. You can see that as shutter open time increases, the induced motion blur smooths the walking motion. You can see the people become fuzzier and fuzzier, and then they start to disappear. The next examples show interval changes. The apparent speed of the walking increases. The people move faster and faster. This is changing time compression. The next example is typical of landscape time lapse, one of my favorites. The interval in this case was seven seconds. The shutter speed started at 1 2,000th to control brightness, but was 1 1 25th at the end. This is not an example of the 180 degree rule. It would certainly have been acceptable to shoot this scene with a shorter interval, like four or five seconds, and I could have reduced shutter speed if I had used a neutral density filter. Choices, choices, so many choices. Don't worry, I'm getting to the end in a moment. The last video is an example of longer exposure time lapse. This is typical astrophotography, shooting stars in the Milky Way. When you are shooting the stars, conservatively observe the rule of 500. This is just a rough guide, but it's okay to get you in the ballpark. To use the rule, divide 500 by the focal length of the lens. The result is the time in seconds for an exposure that will keep stars acceptably sharp, not perfectly. A 25 millimeter lens results in 20 seconds. It will certainly improve your shots if you use shorter exposure times, if you have ISO and aperture choices that will allow it. The clip you're watching was shot at 12 second intervals using an F1.4 25 millimeter lens. There's one more consideration for interval based on camera electronics. Your interval needs to consider the shutter speed plus the time to write each frame to the memory card. 
I've spoken about shutter speed and interval and some of the science behind choices you can make. Sometimes the situation will cause conflict among the choices. One consideration says shorter, another says longer. It becomes a balancing act. If you want a good starting place, use the 180 degree shutter to get reasonable motion blur. Then, think about the examples I've shown. Combine those thoughts with these generally applicable intervals. A half second interval works well for traffic, fast motion, and flowing water. One to three seconds is good for people walking, clouds, telephoto shots, and night traffic. Four to five seconds works well for clouds, sunrise, and sunset. Up to 30 seconds can work well for astrophotography. I strongly recommend that you experiment near your home to learn what you get with your chosen settings. Don't worry about the shots not being ready for prime time. You're just getting used to choices, setting the camera, and taking the shots. There is a learning curve in all this. Reduce the captures to video and adjust your parameters if you don't see what you want. You're in control and you can decide. Do all this before you go many miles out into the wild places. If your shots are good, that's great. But if they're not, then it's easier near home. Most of the time, I respond to sincere questions regarding my tutorials. If you're truly stuck, ask a question in the comment section. That's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned something valuable. If you aren't one of my YouTube subscribers, please subscribe. There are more tutorials coming. Thanks for watching. I made this video for you.